everyone at the back here, may raise your hands. Nice, that's pretty nice. Wicked. <coughs> Psychedelic Society of Edinburgh's 11th event. It's been almost a year since we launched the Society in this very room. On the 13th of April last year, 500 curious beings turned up to hear Stephen Reid, who's the director and founder of the Society in London. They turned up to hear Katie McLeod, who is the National Training and Development Officer for the SDF, the Scottish Drugs Forum. And they turned up to hear Professor David Nutt, you might have heard of him. Um, they turned up to share their thoughts and research with us. The night was a great success and got us very excited for things to come. It seems fitting that we are here again, 500 strong. Uh, I see a few empty seats, they might turn up. But yeah, we, this, this room only takes 500 people and we sold out last week, um, which is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, so once again, it's great to see so many familiar faces um, in the crowd, and of course, lots of new ones. From the bottom and the top of my heart, I thank you all so much for being here. Um, not just in this room, but on this planet, it is a miracle that you all actually exist. Remember it. <laughs> it really is. Um, as I said before, the Psychedelic Society of Edinburgh started last year. Ian and I, this guy here. Hey. <laughs> Um, along with a friend, attended the launch of the Society in London in November 2014. A few months later, Stephen, the director of the Society in London, was looking for people to start societies in other cities, so he naturally jumped at the chance. Since then, we've held monthly events ranging from storytelling, where brave souls turned up um, and shared their experiences with these sacred medicines and how they've helped them through um, dark times uh, in their lives. Um, we've had Raising Awareness Days, where we have flyered about the benefits of psilocybin um, on the Royal Mile uh, to mainly uh, tourists from America. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, we've had film screenings. We have filmed Neurons to Nirvana. We have uh, screened A New Understanding, um, The Science of Psilocybin, um, which is a beautiful movie. Uh, we've also had a LEAP event, uh, LEAP stands for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We had Jim Duffy talk for us, who was in the Strathclyde police, police for 32 years, and um, he retired, and now he's joined LEAP and said, Prohibition is absolute bollocks, and we need to do something about it. Um, and we've had social gatherings um, that have occasionally ended up in side trans events. <laughs> we are a psychedelic society. Um, so support has grown and grown, and it's really heartwarming to see. There are now societies popping up, popping up throughout the UK. Please help us spread the word. I realise I'm rocking back and forth. Um, the society advocates the use of psychedelics as a tool for awakening to the underlying unity and interconnectedness of all things. We help campaign for the legal regulation of these substances and support research into the amazing benefits of psychedelics. We are huge supporters of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, the Beckley Foundation, the Hefter Research Institute, Breaking Convention, and many other organizations like this. On that topic, please feel free to get a photo taken with our MAPS leaflet. It's kicking around somewhere. It says, I support psychedelic science um, after the talk. Um, we hope to put together a big album and send it to MAPS, showing our support from Scotland. <laughs> Now, I'll hand you over to my good friend um, and co-founder, coordinator, person, Ian, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Hello, Hello. Uh, So thank you, Neil. Uh, you know, we, um, we joked last year about putting this event on 
Uh, so actually, to be doing now is very soon. But um, yeah, thank you very much all for being here. Um, also, folk have travelled from the top and the bottom of the country, and also England and even Ireland. So thank you all very much for making the journey. Uh, to be back at this swanky location a year later with, uh, with 500 wonderful people uh, because of shared interest in and appreciation of psychedelics is just magnificent. So thank you again. Uh, so the excitement over tonight has been tremendous, uh, and it's no surprise. Our speaker, born in Edinburgh, uh, has been a journalist for many of the top papers in Britain and has written many fascinating books on the origins of humanity and consciousness in the last 30 years. He has um, also sold over 5 million copies of his books and has just released the long-anticipated uh, Magicians of the Gods, which I highly recommend you all buy and read as soon as you can. Um, you may also be aware of him by appearing on the massively popular uh, Joe Rogan podcast series, um, or indeed from his mighty and famously banned TED Talk, which <laughs> thankfully has now had millions of views on YouTube. <laughs> now, um, we only have a hall until half past nine here, so, and we will try and go over that if we can, because uh, no one's going anywhere. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm keen to stop talking. But um, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A. And if you have a book to be signed, or we'd like a quick photograph, then there will hopefully be time. And also, if a fire situation uh, presents itself, hopefully not, then uh, it's out the doors and to the left. And also, if you can keep noise to a minimum, please, I'm sure you'll all behave very well, but uh, keep your mobiles off and that kind of thing. <coughs> And uh, that's about it. So if you will join me in giving a warm welcome to the stage, <laughs> Mr. Graham Hancock. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. First question, am I audible? At the, yeah. at the back. Good. Um, I'm just recovering from a really horrendous chest infection. I'm still running a bit of a temperature, so if I have a coughing fit or if I lose my voice, you'll understand why. Okay, I hope. But I'll do my best. I'll do my best not to. I want to thank the Psychedelic Society of Edinburgh for uh, inviting me uh, to give this controversial talk. Um, and I think it's uh, I think it's good that we're doing it in an establishment mainstream place like this, because this needs to become part of the mainstream conversation. And uh, I know that all of us uh, in, in this room are working towards that in our own ways. We can turn the lights down now. Um, what I'm going to say tonight uh, draws in some ways on material in three of my books. One of them is a novel in the middle, Entangled a novel that I wrote after downloading the plot uh, during a series of ayahuasca sessions. Um, <laughs> strangest thing that ever happened to me, I have to say, because I was not a novelist, but over those two weeks in Brazil, I got a very strong message, and I ended up writing a novel, um, and I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, ben, Supernatural is my main book on, relating to psychedelics and altered states of consciousness, but there are elements of The Master Game here, which was a book that was originally titled um, talisman. Um, so, I'm showing this to make a point. Psychedelics are an extremely serious matter. They are not for children. They are for adults. There are certain privileges in our society that are reserved for adults, and I believe rightly so. And psychedelics are one of those. But I also believe that if we want to keep psychedelics and other substances out of the hands of children until they are ready for them, we need to legalize psychedelics. Keeping them illegal is the cause of the problem, not the solution to the problem. And I think everybody in this room shares that view, that the war on drugs is an absurd and nonsensical enterprise which has done vast harm over the last 40 years. Now, interestingly enough, if you go back to ancient Egypt, 1700 years ago, um, we have a, a schoolroom in the Dakhla Oasis in Lower Egypt 
and there are Greek writings on its walls which include positive references to drugs. I think we cannot imagine that in our schools today. Um, in context of a story from the Odyssey about the Trojan War, um, basically Helen of Troy is giving her guests opium, uh, a drug that takes away grief and anger and brings forgetfulness of every ill. Whoever should drink this down when it is mixed in a bowl would not let fall a tear down his cheek in the course of that day, at least. Um, in Crete, uh, there was a poppy goddess, an opium poppy goddess, uh, with the cuts in the, in the side of the poppy that releases the sap. Um, and uh, of course, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, his famous poem, in Zan let's see if I can remember some of it. In, uh, in Zanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. As Coleridge was writing this poem under the influence of opium, a knock came on the door. It was the postman. He took delivery of a package. By the time he returned to his seat, he'd forgotten all the rest of the poem. So we only have a fragment. <laughs> <laughs> this fragment, with a good deal more not recoverable, composed in a sort of reverie brought on by two <coughs> grains of opium in the fall of the year 1797. Um, I don't like the title of William Emberton's book, Narcotic Plants, because largely we're not dealing with narcotic substances here. <coughs> but nevertheless, it's an excellent book and I highly recommend it. Uh, for, for showing the use of plant-based substances in ancient civilizations. We're looking at some material from Egypt here. Um, and, and here we have uh, Nefertiti uh, presenting an opium poppy, opium poppy heads to her husband, uh, Akhenaten. I somehow can't imagine uh, Queen Elizabeth presenting Prince Philip with <laughs> opium poppy heads. And then uh, here, this is, these are these are datura flowers. Uh, this is a, the highly visionary datura plant. The rays of the datura plant, the flower are, are descending into the, the third eye, the forehead of this, this lady here. And then the blue water lily is all over ancient Egyptian art. Um, and it's not just about its pleasing aroma. Uh, the blue water lily is a mild hallucinogen. Um, and we know that the ancient Egyptians used it for visionary purposes. The way that the visionary properties can be released is to in, in, um, infuse it in, in wine, for example. Um, and traces of a liquid extract from the blue water lily were discovered in alabaster jars stored in Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, we're looking at the ancient Egyptian tree of life here. And here we see the god Thoth the god of wisdom, the inventor of writing. And he is writing the name of the pharaoh Seti I on the tree of life. You can see this relief in the temple of Karnak and it looks for that region. Um, effectively saying that the pharaoh Seti I has earned the life of millions of years, the immortality. The tree of life has recently been identified by my good friend Dennis McKenna, who's the brother of the late, great Terence McKenna. Dennis is an ethnopharmacologist, and he's identified this tree in its acacia melotica. <coughs> and it turns out that it is rich in dimethyltryptamine, in DMT. Now, it's a bit of an operation to get the DMT out of the bark of that tree, or some chemistry. And academics have said the ancient Egyptians, they would never have had the chemical knowledge to release the DMT from the bark. So this is the moment when we need to ask ourselves, where actually do we get the word chemistry from? It comes from the ancient name of Egypt, which was Kemet. The Arabs referred to al Kemet, which became alchemy, and the very word chemistry comes from the name of ancient Egypt. So I, I'm quite sure the ancient Egyptians were able to extract the DMT from the tree of life. And we can therefore say that we do actually know what the ancient Egyptians were smoking. Ah. <laughs> uh, Tutankhamun's tomb again. This is an extraordinary relief on the second shrine. We see the initiate again connected through the third eye, with, through rays to stars uh, in the sky. It's an intensely visionary scene. Um, and speaking of the third eye, the, the pineal gland, um, it's interesting, this is a meme going around on the internet, but it's interesting to look at the eye of Horus and to compare it with the structure 
of the pineal gland, and indeed this pine cone on the staff of Osiris, all of them are pineal references, and the pineal gland, uh, we'll be talking a bit more about it uh, later, but it seems the ancient Egyptians may have known something that science says they shouldn't yet have known. This is Tiwanaku in uh, Bolivia, at an altitude of 14,000 feet uh, above sea level. It's a, a giant, mysterious ancient site, which I've talked about a lot in my Lost Civilization books. Um, there are a number of statues in Tiwanaku, uh, like these, the, the Ponche and Bennett monoliths, for example. Um, and you know, the Ancient Aliens crew on that Ancient Aliens TV show, they like to say these are alien ray guns that they're holding here. But I'm afraid that that's not what they are. Actually what they are is snuff trays for an adenanthra snuffs, for snuffing DMT, basically. Um, and indeed, snuff trays of that sort uh, are, are still found in the Amazon uh, today. And, and Dr. Man Manuel Torres is the person who's done the research and identified uh, what was really going on at Tiwanaku. Um, this pyramid site is about 60 miles north of Lima in Peru. It's all been excavated in the last 10 years. It's just an extraordinary complex of roughly the same antiquity as the complex of Giza in Egypt. Um, and archaeologists were stunned to discover no evidence of warfare whatsoever. This was a, this was a society that cooperated with its neighbors and had nurturing and positive relationships with its neighbors. And perhaps we shouldn't be surprised when we discover that their imports included hallucinogenic snuffs from the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon. Francisco de Orellana was a Spanish conquistador, uh, and he found himself uh, at the mouth of the Amazon uh, in the 1500s, 1540s. He went with 20 men in a, a little longboat on what they thought was a one-day hunting expedition. Um, the Amazon River disagreed, uh, and uh, 4,000 miles later, they emerged in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, having traveled the entire course of the Amazon. Uh, along the way, uh, Oriana reported seeing huge cities and evidence of sophisticated <coughs> cultures. Um, and for centuries afterwards, historians said that he'd made that all up, that it was just complete nonsense. He did it to aggrandize his own, his own journey. But the tragic clearances of the Amazon are revealing to us the truth that the Amazon has always been a human-managed environment, and that it did support very large uh, urban settlements at one time. Um, and something else, they have found this most mysterious soil distributed around the Amazon basin. Rainforest soils are normally not very good for agriculture, but there are spots in the Amazon that's just perfect for agriculture. And that's because of this ancient soil, which goes back at least 11,000 years, and it turns out it's a man-made soil, uh, that it constantly reinvigorates its own fertility uh, as a result of this. So there's something was going on in the Amazon more than 10,000 years ago that's really very intriguing. And uh, again, emerging from, from the rainforest, we can see these huge geoglyphs and uh, indeed uh, even, even stone circles are appearing in the Amazon. So there's a hidden history there that we need to know more about. It's estimated that there's about 150,000 different species of plants and trees uh, in, the, in the Amazon. And it's the shamans of the Amazon who are being the experts in those plants and trees. And I'm here with Francisco Montesuna. I think that our screen, Ian, has just zoomed out again. Um, uh, I'm with Francisco Montesuna, <coughs> and um, we are crouched down beside a bush that is uh, known in the Amazon as Chacruna. Uh, botanically, it's Cicotria viridis, and the leaves uh, contain uh, a reasonable proportion of, of dimethyltryptamine, of DMT. Now, if I were speaking to any other audience, um, I couldn't take this knowledge for granted. I'm sure that almost everybody, perhaps everybody in this room knows this, that DMT is not normally orally active. That uh, the monoamine oxidase enzyme in our gut neutralizes DMT. So what you want if you're going to take DMT orally is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. 
And it's the case that if you made a tea out of the leaves of this plant, uh, it would have no effect on you whatsoever because uh, of that enzyme actually in the gut. But the other element of the ayahuasca brew, the ayahuasca vine, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So when you mix the two of them together, the leaves and the vine, and uh, cook, cook it up in a pot with, with water, you get ayahuasca, the vine of souls, uh, with orally active DMT as the key active ingredient. These days it's usually poured off into plastic bottles um, and uh, anybody who's drunk uh, ayahuasca <coughs> looking at those plastic bottles uh, will probably be having a little shudder right now uh, because the taste of course is truly horrendous. The smell is really bad as well. I would say um, essence of old socks, um, <coughs> battery acid, <laughs> sulfur, some raw sewage, and just a hint of chocolate. <laughs> That's the ayahuasca taste. And then, of course, it's going to make you vomit, it's going to give you diarrhea. Why would anybody do this? <laughs> we'll come on to it. We'll come on to it. There's another form of uh, ayahuasca, yahe, uh, which, is, which is made with um, a slightly different ingredients. The ayahuasca vine is involved, and another vine, the Plumptris Camerata, provides the, 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 the DMT. But somewhere way back in the Amazon, I do not believe by trial and error, out of those 150,000 different plants and trees, the shamans put together the two or three that can produce this extraordinary medicine that is making its way around the world and changing the world day by day. We're in the highlands, uh, in the Andes here, uh, on our way from the coast of Peru uh, to Chavit de Huantar. Again, we're about 14,000 feet up here, then you drop down into Chavin. Um, and there's the, uh, a message there. In this town of Chavin lies a great edifice made of well-carved stones of notable grandeur. Um, and beneath the ground are great halls and rooms so great that there are certain stories they extend beneath the river and pass near the Huaca or ancient shrine. Turns out that these stories are true, that, that Chavin is full of these underground galleries. In fact, they devoted their greatest efforts to the, the creation of places like this with rather scary bits of statuary found inside them. So what were they doing? Why were they creating these underground galleries? Well, we know why. Because their psychedelic of choice uh, was the San Pedro cactus, where the active ingredient is mescaline, and they were creating a setting for the Wachuma experience. Uh, uh, the setting is at least important, as important as the substance, and in those darkened galleries, extraordinary experiences would have unfolded. And if we're in any doubt, we can see the iconography uh, prominently features the San Pedro cactus. More art, <coughs> dealing with a peyote button from Monte Alba, a peyote ball from Western Mexico. Again, the peyote cactus, the active ingredients, is also mescaline, as it is with the, the San Pedro cactus. Um, and Palenque, the, the pyramid of the inscriptions, part of Maya culture. Let's not say that the Maya use of psychedelics brought them culturally low. The Maya were one of the great cultures of, of antiquity, and, and the use of psychedelics were absolutely central uh, to, their, to their operation. The, these Maya mushroom stones speak for themselves. Salasabin mushrooms from Guatemala, pre-classic Maya, about 500 BC. Um, and then if we go to the predecessor culture of the Maya, the Olmecs, who left us these extraordinary pieces of statuary. If I were giving my lost civilization talk, I'd have a lot to tell you about this one. Uh, they left us these extraordinary pieces of statuary. Uh, and uh, the Olmecs, their favorite psychedelic was Amanita muscaria, the, the fly agaric. And we can see, uh, again, from their art, uh, an Olmec baby weird jaguar wearing an Amanita muscaria mushroom cap, and right, Amanita muscaria transforming into the jaguar god, about 1200 BC. Um, has everybody heard of Soma? Yeah. yeah. yeah? yeah. It's a uh, prominently referenced in the Vedas, in the ancient, the ancient Indian texts. Uh, and really very mysterious, what is this substance that connected humanity with the gods, was associated with blinding light? What was, 
what was what was going on here. Well, finally, the, the study was done, a really in-depth study, Argon and Wasson and others investigated this. And the conclusion they came to is very clear, that actually what Soma was, was Amanita muscaria. It was the Amanita muscaria mushroom, um, and, and which, was, which was turned into a drink. Now, let me tell you something about the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Uh, if, uh, if you want to have a journey with the Amanita muscaria mushroom, it's better to pass it through a human body first. That's what the shamans uh, of the Tungus Mongol do with Amanita muscaria. They eat the mushroom and then they pee it out into bowls and then members of the group will drink the urine. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's been established that you can pass, the Amanita muscaria does not lose its potency until it's been passed through seven human bodies. <laughs> Seems that the body filters out many of the toxins and you get a much purer uh, psychedelic in the urine that you get to taking it alone. At any rate, one of the key bits of evidence in the Vedas uh, is a reference to the priests drinking soma and then pissing soma. Well, you drink tea and then you piss urine, but when you drink Amanita muscaria, you're passing through the pure, purely potent substance. Uh, of course, the case is much more detailed than that, but uh, that's an important part of it. Eleusis in Greece, now a sad ruin about 30 miles outside of Athens, um, was the beating heart of the, of the Greek world. If we in the West and our politicians who are presently waging war on drugs all admire Greeks, the ancient Greeks and, and Greek democracy, so perhaps they should be educated that, that psychedelics were absolutely at the heart of everything that was wonderful about ancient Greece. And Eleusis uh, speaks to that. Cicero wrote, Athens has given nothing to the world more excellent or divine than the Eleusinian mysteries. Pindar, happy is he who having seen these rites goes below the hollow earth for he knows the end of life and he knows its God sent beginning. Other initiates included Plato, Aristotle, Sophocles. Sophocles wrote, thrice happy are those mortals who having seen these rites depart for Hades. For them is alone, alone is granted to have a true life there. What we now know from the research is that the potion that the initiates at Eleusis were given to drink was essentially LSD. It was Claviceps um, paspali, uh, which is a non-poisonous form of ergot containing LSD-like visionary alkaloids. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised to find the use of psychedelics at the heart of so many advanced ancient civilizations because actually psychedelics appear to have played a key role in the emergence of modern human behavior. And this was the essential point that I was making in my book, Supernatural. This is what I call six million years of boredom. This is the uh, family tree from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee through to anatomically modern human beings. And, and for most of this period, our ancestors were just incredibly dull. Very, very boring creatures who you would not want to have dinner with. They um, invented the first stone tools uh, about two and a half million years ago, but having invented them, they stuck with them without any change at all for the next million years. So this tells us two things. Cultural information was being passed on, and the people who were passing it on were incredibly rigid and narrow-minded, and they weren't thinking outside the box. And then when you do get to change, the Acheulean tool tradition, tool tradition, well, it sticks for a million years as well. And it's not until the great cave art is introduced, you start seeing the first hints about 100,000 years ago, but you really have to go to 40,000 years ago, unless this is Lascaux, it's about 17,000 years ago. Uh, to see that something has changed. We are not dealing with um, simply repetitively passing on stone tools. We're seeing, seeing extraordinary symbolic art uh, in these vast underground cathedrals. We are dealing with creatures exactly like ourselves. Um, and it's interesting if we look at the art that the, the oldest surviving cave art in the world depicts creatures that are part human and part animal in form. That's, the technical term is a therianthro, from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man. So from Fumani Cave in Italy, we have this upright human figure, but with the head and horns of an orc, an extinct species of, 
of bull. And here in Hollenstein, Stadel Cave, Germany, 32,000 years old, a lion man, creature part lion and part human. And uh, this is from Chauvet Cave in France, again, it's about 32,000 years old. Um, and it's really interesting to analyze this. First of all, we see a bison's head here, but attached to a human body. So this is bison man. And he is straddling a female figure, a prominent pubic triangle there. But oddly, the female figure is headless, except that her right arm is transforming into the head of a lion. Okay, so I think it's safe to say that this is not something that you see every day when you're out hunting in fields. <laughs> what we're looking at is a moment of shape-shifting here, a female transforming into a, into a lion and about to make love with a bison man. Um, and then perched on, and now we're in, that's in France, now we're in South Africa, perched on a zigzag in the Cedarberg, we have humans transforming into antelopes. And here in the Drakensberg, it's a bit difficult to see if you're back at the room, but human bodies, antelope heads, this one's wrapped around with two serpents, both of which have got antelope heads, and this one's growing a feather out of its back. Where do ideas like this come from? <coughs> what is the explanation for ideas like this? Why is there a grid, a geometric grid between these two ibexes in Alaska? What about these flows of dots and window shapes running down the walls of El Castillo Cave in Spain? Well, what cracked this, what's helped science to understand what's going on with the cave art was indeed research using hallucinogenic drugs, LSD, DMT, mescaline. I see, I feel angry with myself for even saying the words hallucinogenic drugs. I think we should stop using those words altogether. It's kind of habitual, but I just said it. Um, LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, etc., to induce altered states of consciousness in, in human volunteers. And, and what emerged from these studies were, were very definite universal um, issues uh, that, that initially geometric patterns would be seen, scintillating zigzags of wavy lines and starbursts and internested curves and so on and so forth. Then they might begin to take a bit of form. Then there's a sense of passing through a vortex into a seamlessly convincing parallel world inhabited by intelligent entities who communicate with us, apparently telepathically. And this volunteer on, on Mescaline, I believe it was, drew the entity that he encountered, put him in a modern business suit, and gave him the head of a fox. So, not different, really, from the lion man or the bison man from the painted caves. And we begin to understand the strange art of the painted caves as an art of visions. The shamans were entering deeply altered states of consciousness. They were experiencing visions, returning to the alert problem, say, the solving state of consciousness. They then painted those visions on the cave walls. Um, and the, the academic work behind this, uh, the leading figure is Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. And I'm just summarizing quickly what he's come to, the specific characteristics of cave art, the therianthropes, the distinctive patterns, suggest this was an art of visions. David argues that it was the work of prehistoric shamans who'd experienced altered states of consciousness and afterwards set out to document their visions. This is really the, the, the strongest theory of what cave art is all about. And if you want to go into it in depth, here are some of David's books inside the, the, the Mind in the Cave is the one to read, really. That's the, the, the best one. Uh, so the point is that the art itself bears witness to the use of psychedelics in deep prehistory. But if we wanted further proof of that, uh, new scientists trumpeted this in March 2011 as the earliest evidence for magic mushroom use in Europe, Cytocyte Hispanica on the walls of a paper cave uh, in Spain. Um, as this art appears, everything else about humanity changes as well. Stone tools, hunting tactics, spiritual ideas. For example, before the art appears, our ancestors weren't burying their dead. Then they suddenly start burying their dead, and they start burying them with grave goods, with food, with water, which suggests that they've got some concept of, that, that, that the individual, that some aspect of the individual survives death and, and goes on. All of these things took a quantum leap forward at the same time that our ancestors began to record typical visionary experiences in their art. It's probable that this is when human languages first evolved. Now, what we can say is that the use of psychedelics and these developments in human behavior correlate very, very closely 
It's another step to say that psychedelics caused this. Personally, I think they did. I think psychedelics was what, was what put us on the path to modern humanity, but we can say for sure that there's a close correlation. Um, in the light of the evidence from the painted case, I think we need to take a fresh look at ancient art from all around the world. It seems that psychedelics have played a much greater role in the story of civilization than has hitherto been admitted. Here's a ceramic from Ecuador where we see this curious figure and its arm is transforming into a serpent, so reminiscent of the figure from Shone Cave where the woman's arm is transforming into the head of a lion. A uh, bird-headed figure seated on a throne from the Maya, all make stone figure with feline features and so on and so forth. These are classic visionary images. And then go back into <coughs> mythology, Theseus slaying the Minotaur, everybody's heard the story, but wherever do you encounter creatures with human bodies and the heads of bulls? Regularly in visions, but not really anywhere else. Here we have a bull man wrestling with a lion in a cab, 1800 BC. All these figures from ancient Babylon, and, and of course all of the ancient Egyptian gods were classic therianthropes, whether it's Thoth with his ibis head, or, or whether it's Anubis, the guide of souls, jackal-headed Anubis, the great sphinx is a therianthrope. Um, and, and here, this deceased lady is looking at her own soul. It's a beautiful vision. The, the, the ancient Egyptians envisaged the soul as having many different aspects, and one aspect of the soul was the ba soul, the bird, which could fly free, liberated from the chains of the body. And, and here she's she's looking at her own at her own soul in the form of a, a ba bird. So in the light of all this, in the light of the fact that psychedelics <coughs> have clearly been involved in positive ways with human culture since the very beginning, I think it's reasonable to wonder why is our society so rabid about consciousness altering drugs and drugs? <coughs> Particularly where the psychedelics are concerned, what is it that those in power are really afraid of? Because look, it's a serious criminal offense to possess dimethyltryptamine, whether in smokable form or, or as part of the ayahuasca brew, yet as we'll, we'll see, DMT is a, a natural brain hormone. We're all already illegal in this room. <laughs> and its function remains unknown for lack of research. So it seems, it seems absurd that a human being's life can be ruined simply for possession of this substance. It seems a very odd, odd thing, but, and it seems to be out of step with the human story. And it's even odder when we realize that our society is not against altered states of consciousness as such. On the contrary, our society allows the big pharmaceutical companies to make billions every year from churning out consciousness altering <coughs> drugs. And this unholy alliance between big pharma and psychiatry is worrying as well, where every year psychiatrists invent new mental illnesses that Big Pharma will provide more consciousness-altering medicines, supposedly, to remedy. So, you know, we have uh, Prozac and, and, and Siroxat, so-called antidepressants, or, or Ritalin, to manage attention deficit disorder. These are consciousness-altering drugs, but they're completely legal in our society. They're damn dangerous drugs as well. The, 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 the linking of suicidal mentation and suicidal actions to the SSRIs is very clear. Uh, and yet they're still completely legal and promoted in our society. And then, of course, we have a love affair with alcohol. Um, arguably, the world's most boring drug. Um, glamorized in our society, uh, promoted, associated in positive ways with all kinds of lifestyles. A damn dangerous drug. Alcohol is an extremely dangerous drug. It kills huge numbers of people every year. Our politicians tell us that they made psychedelics illegal because they're dangerous to protect us. So why is alcohol legal then? Because it is definitely dangerous. It does kill huge numbers of people, whether from cirrhosis of the liver, or in road accidents, or just mindless, stupid violence. And yet, perfectly okay in our society. 
for anybody to drink themselves into a stupor and vomit all over their friends. <laughs> Many different states of consciousness are available to us. We are complex creatures. We are not one-dimensional creatures. That's part of the human birthright, this complexity. What our society values and glorifies is what I call the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. Now let me be clear that I'm not against the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. It has its place. It's important. When I get on an aircraft, I would like the pilot to be in an alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. And I would like him to stay in that state all the way through the flight. After he lands, I don't care what he does with his head. But while he's flying me, I want him alert and problem-solving. As its place, the problem is that our society has given an over-monopolistic dominance of the state of consciousness. I think that's why alcohol and antidepressants are tolerated. They don't challenge the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. They may even support the dominance of that state. Psychedelics tend to lead to questioning of the established control system in our society and the states of consciousness that serve it. Now my remote control has failed, so I will move over here. Oh my god. The Sheraton have sent me a message. I'm not going to read it. Um, okay, so bear that in mind. Psychedelics lead to question of the established control system of our society. And let's go and just give a few minutes thought to the Gnostics. Uh, a heretical sect of the early centuries of the Christian era. Gnosticism, we know about it at all in depth in its own voice because of a find that was made near here, near the temple of Hathor at Dendra in Upper Egypt, at a place called Nag Hammadi, where was found a trove of Gnostic texts which had been buried around about the 400s AD. Now this was a time when Christianity had become the dominant religion in Egypt, but the Gnostics were, had a radically, they weren't regarded themselves as Christians, but they had a radically different take on the whole religious project. And the faction of Christianity that became the Roman Catholic Church had come to power. And it began a massive persecution of the Gnostics. The first burnings at the stake were carried out and the Gnostics were driven underground. And at some point, some of them chose to bury a library of their texts, the so-called Nag Hammadi Library. And these were buried, um, as I say, near Dendra. And they were not recovered until 1945. Until 1945, all we knew about the Gnostics came down to us from those who had persecuted them. Uh, there was a view that Gnosticism hated the material world. We now know that that's not the case. There was a very complicated, a very complicated religious idea, and I don't have time to go into it in depth here, but, but essentially there's this spiritual realm and gradual density, increasing densities of matter. And one of the aeons, the great goddesses of the Plerima, of the All, uh, began to envisage a singularity. She began to dream the Anthropos. She began to dream of humanity. And in that dreaming, she, she fell from the cosmic realm into the realm of matter. And she manifests as the Earth. So it's impossible for the Gnostics to hate the Earth, since the Earth herself is the goddess that, that they regarded so highly. In her fall, a kind of cosmic accident occurred, uh, and an entity was, was formed who the Gnostics called the Demiurge. And from the Gnostic point of view, it's the Demiurge that we have been taught to worship through all of the mainstream religions. Um, I got another bloody message from the show. <laughs> Maybe I'll press cancel and not go on. Okay. Um, so what they're saying is that, 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 that the entity that the mainstream religions call God, uh, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, or Allah, isn't God at all. God 
is up there in the pleroma, in the distant cosmic realm. This is a minor supernatural who has imposed himself upon mankind. Uh, he's, he's jealous, he's envious, he wants the worship of mankind. And most of all, he wants to snuff out the divine spark within us. The divine spark that would allow us to liberate ourselves from his control. Um, and, and, and so the project of the Demiurge and his Archons is to mislead and enslave mankind and to work to prevent us from ever awakening to our true potential. Uh, so the activities of the Archons of Demiurge is to spread fear and hatred and suspicion amongst us and to drive us into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. Now interestingly, if we look at the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, they turn everything upside down in the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden. We'll come to that in a moment, but what's fascinating is the Tree of Life <coughs> from the Gnostic perspective. The Tree of Life is an Amanita Muscaria mushroom, it's a psychedelic mushroom. And in the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, we're brought up to believe that the serpent was the bad guy. <coughs> From the Gnostic point of view, the serpent was the good guy. Because what the serpent is saying to Adam and Eve is, if you are to grow and develop as souls, you must have knowledge of good and evil. You will be defined by your choices. If you stay in this state where you have no knowledge of good and evil, you will have no possibility of progressing and, and developing. And in that sense, the knowledge of good and evil is essential to the progress of the soul. And so from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent was doing Adam and Eve a favor. And then the Demiurge intervenes, as we know, and Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden um, and prevented from ever returning to the garden in case they find their way to the tree of life. <coughs> the flood in the Gnostic uh, scheme of things wasn't inflicted to punish evil, but to punish humanity for having risen so high and to take the light, the gnosis that was growing amongst men the survivors were thrown into great distraction and into a life of toil so that mankind might be occupied with worldly affairs and might, have the opportunity, might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the Holy Spirit. Throughout history, those who've sought the liberating gnosis, the light, knowledge of the true nature of things, have been persecuted. Let me give you an example of that persecution. It concerns a, an amazing culture that established itself in southwest France um, in the 11 and 1200s, 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, called the Cathars. They were based around here in the Languedoc. It was an incredibly advanced culture. They believed in universal literacy. They were the first paper makers. They, they, they spread knowledge of, of, of writing. They believed in absolute equality between men and women. They uh, created wonderful poetry. The troubadours came from the, came from the Cathars. In many ways, they were an incredible, ideal, and beautiful society, but they had one problem. They believed that the Pope was the devil's agent on earth. And that was a dangerous thing to believe in the 13th century. And as a result, the Roman Catholic Church sent down a crusade uh, to destroy the Cathars. Um, and uh, this resulted in a terrible uh, genocide. Uh, the, the burning and destruction of the Cathar cities, the, the wiping out of the, of the Cathars, and the burning and destruction of all of their books, and all of this being done in the name of God. So from the Gnostic point of view, the Demiurge and his archons and their human servants are always trying to steal the light, and are certainly doing so today. And from the Gnostic point of view, if the light is growing amongst mankind today, then we can be sure that tremendous archonic forces are working to suppress it. If the Gnostic scenario were correct, then how might we expect these forces to manifest? Not wishing to cause any offense, but I would say one of the ways they manifest is through the three big monotheistic faiths, which are not these days, in any way, as far as I can see, about the liberation of the human soul, but rather about control, um, and these religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they all talk the talk of peace and love. But the walk they walk is often very different, has been very different down through history, whether it's the burnings at the stake of Christianity, the last burning of a witch was in the 1700s. 
um, or, or whether it's the sex abuse scandals in the Roman Catholic Church or, 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 or whether it's Islam stoning <coughs> women to death because they've looked at another guy, you know? And then we have um, the mass murder of the Yazidis by the so-called Islamic State, this Abrahamic death cult, yet another Abrahamic death cult. Um, and then, of course, the state itself is another archonic agent. What, are, what is the state? What is government? Uh, but but uh, a, an effort to remove from us responsibility for our own choices and our own actions, and to devolve that on, on officials, and, and to take our money and to spend it in the way that the state decides, rather than the way that we as individuals <coughs> may decide. The state is about disenfranchising individuals from their freedom and from their liberty. And of course, states operate vis-a-vis -vis one another by multiplying fear and hatred and suspicion. They're constantly pressing the patriotism button. I don't know about you guys, but I think patriotism is a really disgusting thing. I have no sympathy for patriotism whatsoever. Why should I like somebody more because they happen to be born on the same bit of land I was, or under the same bit of government that I was? Isn't what matters the ideas that we all share? Isn't it time we moved beyond patriotism and love of country and started to consider love of fellow humanity without division into nations? I'm not speaking for world government, by the way. <laughs> I don't want any government. I, I want absolutely the most minimal government possible. That's not what I'm talking about, but I, what I am talking about is uh, humanity and our connections to one another. And then of course there are the big corporations. They're also disenfranchising us from ourselves and of course the media with this endless, miserable, depressing, ugly, rolling news designed to convince us that the world is full of ugliness and that there is no, no joy or hope. Um, and all of these forces, I would say, have conspired in the 21st century to create a kind of consciousness Monopoly, and I think it's dangerous to give a monopoly to a single state of consciousness and to enforce that monopoly with draconian criminal sanctions is possibly even suicidal. So, the alert problem solving state of consciousness is good, as I said, for a number of things like flying airplanes, it's good for politics, it's good for commerce. Um, it's good for warfare, it's good for all of those things, but the promise of this state of consciousness that it would bring us endless security, endless prosperity, a bright future, we all know now that that's not true, having gone through the last financial crisis. We know that the bankers can't go on just magically printing electronic money forever to make the problem go away. Um, ours is a society that uh, is just quite insane in many ways, with the spreading of uh, the horrors of pollution. Only a society that was truly insane, having invented nuclear weapons, could allow them to proliferate. A sane society would get rid of nuclear weapons immediately, these horrible, toxic, death-dealing things. And the alert problem-solving state of consciousness of the society based on it, we can't even solve the problem of hunger. Uh, on a worldwide scale. And look what we're doing to the rainforests. Look what we're doing in the, in the Amazon, the incredible destruction that's taking place there, that there seems no way of halting that is driven by economics. It would be possible for the wealthy countries to fund the peoples of the Amazon, never to cut down another tree. It wouldn't cost that much money. But we're too busy spending it on warfare and mass destruction and the multiplication of fear and hatred and suspicion. So we simply stand by while this sacred realm and this home of biodiversity on Earth is destroyed. We throw up our hands in horror, but we do nothing about it. So I don't think we're going to be able to move to a new state of consciousness using the old state of consciousness laden down with these iconic constraints. We're going to have to throw off those constraints. We're going to have to transcend the old state of consciousness completely. Gnosticism won't help, it's dead and gone. Um, but in unexpected places, there are still people we can learn from. And those places include the Amazon rainforest, where there are still uncontacted tribes. 
And my first experiences with ayahuasca were in the heart of the Amazon jungle. Um, and way back then, I, I talked with the shamans many, many times about the state of the world and the sickness of the West. Don't imagine because people in the, live in the Amazon that they don't know what's happening in the outside world, they absolutely do. Um, and, and we talked about this, and, and I asked them, what, what do they think is wrong with, with the advanced urban societies? And they said, it's really simple. You've severed your connection to spirit. And they propose a remedy for this problem, which is ayahuasca. A portal to enchanted realms via a shudderingly awful taste. <laughs> so, as you're vomiting and you know running behind a tree, um, we in the West are very inhibited by our bodies, obviously. But the message that ayahuasca brings home is that we are ultimately our bodies. We are our consciousness. And at the level of consciousness, what's happening with ayahuasca is really extraordinary. And for those who haven't drunk ayahuasca, Pablo Amarillo's amazing paintings of his ayahuasca experiences bring to life that enchanted, sentient, supernatural realm. And many artists around the world are now picking up the ayahuasca <coughs> message. I'm privileged to be close friends with Alex Gray. Um, and also with the late, great Robert Venosa, uh, artists whose work has been transformed by the ayahuasca experience. And the message that they put across is one of those universals that everyone who drinks the brew sooner or later reports. And it's about the sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. Ayahuasca can be personally quite tough because what tends to to happen is that you go through episodes in your life, you have a kind of life with you, um, and, and you suddenly start seeing yourself from the other person's point of view. You know, you may have justified those harsh words or, or actions that you aimed at another person. It may have seemed perfectly reasonable to you at the time. Ayahuasca will show you the other side of the story. It will show you how much those words hurt that person, the pain and suffering you caused. That's why people cry a lot during ayahuasca sessions because they are they are suddenly realizing how toxic they be to others and and it fills you with a with a, a strong will to change your behavior it is very difficult to change a lifetime of bad habits very difficult but ayahuasca at least offers you the opportunity to begin that process um, that's when the work really begins after the session integrating what you've learned not the session itself. Then, of course, most of us in this room are aware of this. Ayahuasca is incredibly effective at getting people off addictions to hard drugs, whether heroin uh, or cocaine. The Takiwasi Clinic in Tarapoto in Peru is doing an excellent job of de-addicting heroin addicts. Typically, a dozen sessions over a month will do it. They leave uh, free of withdrawal symptoms and never return to their addiction. Nonetheless, Western medicine is still delivering methadone to heroin addicts, an incredibly inefficient way of dealing with heroin addiction when ayahuasca can bring about a transformation. And uh, the spirit of ayahuasca is most frequently encountered as a creative guide, as a healer, as a moral teacher. Um, when I started speaking about her, about Mother Ayahuasca, as some kind of real entity, I think that's why my TED talk got banned, because that was considered to be unscientific. But actually, what does science know about this? People all around the world have had the experience of encounter, encountering a, a loving entity who wants them to do better with their lives. How can we explain this? What's, what's going on? Is it just a figment of our brains on drugs? Or is something much, much more happening? So this leads us to ask, what actually are we doing here? What journey are we on? What is consciousness? What happens to me when I die? What is reality? And right there we have to say consciousness is a mystery. We know the brain is involved in it, definitely involved in it in some way, but it's unclear as to exactly how. Now there's a very substantial view in, in mainstream science that the brain 
makes consciousness the way a generator makes electricity. And, and when I've talked to medical doctors about this, they say it's obvious that the brain makes consciousness. And I say, why is it obvious that the brain makes consciousness? And they say, well, look, if I damage part of your brain, or if part of your brain is damaged by a virus, it's going to affect your consciousness. So it's obvious that the brain is making consciousness. Um, but is it that obvious? Because isn't it possible that the relationship between the brain and consciousness is, is more like the relationship um, between uh, the TV signal and the TV set? Yes, if we damage the TV set, the picture is damaged, but not the signal. The signal remains pure. And right now, the state, of, the state of consciousness research cannot say which of the two models uh, is correct. What is reality? There's Albert Hoffman, um, the discoverer of LSD. And he's saying reality is inconceivable without an experiencing subject, product of the exterior world and of a receiver, an ego, in whose deepest self the emanations of the exterior world become consciousness. Conscious. Maybe there's more to the exterior world than our senses can register. Certainly William Blake felt that uh, when he said if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks in his cavern. Um, William James, brother of the novelist Henry James, great uh, psychologist, experimented with nitrous oxide in 1901, um, it made him, led him on a very interesting path of thought that, that these other states of consciousness can be unleashed in, a, in an instant. Um, and, and he's saying that our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness, is but one special type of consciousness. There lie other forms of consciousness all around. Uh, and he's saying that no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. At any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. I think that's a really important point because I think materialist reductionist Western science has prematurely closed its accounts with reality. Uh, Aldous Huxley uh, regarded the brain as a reducing valve, that its primary function is to keep stuff out, to stop us from being overwhelmed by the massive impressions that would, would flow in. And he regarded psychedelics as gratuitous graces, which allowed some of us to bypass the reducing valve. Um, and, and so he says, uh, speaking of those bypasses, through these permanent or temporary bypasses, there flows something more than, and above all, something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material which our narrowed individual minds regard as a complete or at least sufficient picture of reality. Back to Hoffman, um, and, and he's made, uh, developing this receiver an uh, analogy. Uh, that the true importance of LSD and related hallucinogens lies in their capacity to shift the wavelength setting of the receiving self and thereby to evoke alterations in reality consciousness. And then Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico, his work with dimethyltryptamine and human volunteers in the 1990s, uh, Rick coined the concept of channel norm, that we are all tuned in most of the time to channel norm but that there are other channels broadcasting at us all the time which our receiver is not picking up. And that he's suggesting that what DMT does is it alters the receiver wavelength of the brain and allows us to admit into consciousness areas of reality that are normally closed to our senses. And these worlds, he says, are usually invisible to us and our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist only in our minds, is that they are in reality outside us and freestanding. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. Now, I've given this analogy many times, but I'd like to give it just once more here. When people tell you that the visions you experience are just your brain on drugs, how logical is that? See, this is what happens. Um, a volunteer is put on LSD or DMT, and then they stick him or her in an MRI scan. I can't imagine any more ghastly place <laughs> to have a DMT journey than in an MRI scan. And the MRI scanner reveals definite changes taking place in the brain. 
and the individual is reporting extraordinary experiences. So the scientist standing there says, oh, those experiences that he reported, he's reporting, those are just the changes in his brain. That's just, that's just the chemical and electrical changes in the brain which are producing those experiences. They have no reality to those experiences at all. So I think that's very poor logic, and I think this is a simple answer to that logic, is that if we want to look at a very distant star, we need a telescope, obviously. We're going to point it at the right regions of the heavens, uh, and then we're going to begin to focus it. And as we focus it, changes will take place, physical changes will take place inside the barrel of the telescope in the relationship between the lenses. Eventually the star will come into view. We'd be completely wrong to say that the star can be reduced to the physical changes inside the telescope. Those physical changes simply allowed us to see the star that was always there, but that we couldn't see before. And that's the suggestion with hallucinogens in the brain. Now, in these matters, 21st century science really has very little experience and very little valid or useful knowledge. The people we can learn from in this area are the shamans of tribal and hunter-gatherer societies. And altered states of consciousness, visionary states, star trance states are the universal feature common to all shamanism everywhere. And in these altered states of consciousness, it's very common for shamans to report encounters with intelligent supernatural entities, which they usually construe as spirits. They might sometimes take human form, they might appear in the form of an animal, they might be a therianthrope, part animal, part human. And shamans of all cultures also report that they themselves transform into animals or therianthropes during their trance journeys in the spirit world. Now here's a mystery. Many of the experiences that shamans report with spirits are very similar to the encounters with quote-unquote aliens reported by tens of thousands of people in the West who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. Um, and, and the shamans themselves frequently depict uh, UFOs and aliens, for example, in Pablo Amarillo's picture here. Um, and a, and a classic one here, you know, with a classic shamanic therian throat on the side, and then a flying saucer here. Uh, when I got Pablo Amarigo's permission to use these images, I, he's passed away now, but I had a number of long conversations with him. And I asked Pablo, why are you painting flying saucers? What's going on with these flying saucers? Are you saying that people are coming here from other planets? And he said something very interesting. He said the flying saucers are vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. When a shaman speaks of the spirit world, that's pretty close to speaking of a parallel universe in modern scientific terms. Is there possibly some kind of interdimensional con connection being revealed here? At any rate, if you want to know about the phenomenology of shamanism, Mircea Eliade's uh, great work on shamanism is the, is the go-to book. Uh, and we have a huge dossier on the experiences of people uh, who've uh, felt themselves to be abducted by aliens, thanks to the work of John Mack at the University of Harvard, uh, David Jacobs, and Bud Hopkins. So it's possible to compare these dossiers. Um, so the spirits that shamans encounter most frequently appear in the form of animals, birds, or fish, or as stereotropes. And this turns out to be the case with UFO abductees. Um, listing a few examples here. Uh, Virginia Horton sees an intelligent gray deer. Another American reports seeing a deer looking at her through her window just before she's abducted. Another sees a wolf standing on her bed. And John Mack summarizes, the aliens appear to be consummate shapeshifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, owls, eagles, raccoons, and deer are among the creatures the abductees have seen initially. Uh, shamans report being floated up into the sky or, or climbing ropes of light uh, into the sky. It's particularly strong in Bushman shamanism in, in Botswana. But UFO abductees feel, feel that too. They feel they're being carried up into the sky. And, and very specifically, some of them report lines or threads of light or climbing threads of light. How do we account for these similarities in these two apparently extremely different domains? Uh, shamans, as well as being abducted to locations in the sky, are frequently abducted to locations underground and underwater. 
That also turns out to be the case with UFO abductees. And again, I won't read all of these, but you can read them for yourselves. There's a number of examples here where the UFO abductees find themselves underwater or in a cave. And then, of course, the classic feature of shamanism is the shamanic ordeal, that the spirits fall upon the shaman and cut him apart and disassemble him and insert objects under his skin and cut off his head and count his bones and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, how different is that really from the painful piercings and surgical procedures that UFO abductees report? Um, again, I mean, here we have Sandra Larson. Uh, beings removed her brain and set it down beside her. And here we have a Yakut shaman, the spirits cut off his head, which they set aside, bone counting. Or again, the, the, the details are quite extraordinary. Um, shamans frequently report being abducted by spirits and having sex with spirits. As a matter of fact, I know a shaman in, in the Amazon whose wife has left him because of the stuff he does in the spirit world. <laughs> so he's got lots of women over there and kids as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, again, this is true of UFO abductees too. UFO abductees again and again report sex with aliens, a lover in the alien realm, hybrid offspring to whom the abductee is brought repeatedly, apparently in order to hold and cuddle his or her hybrid child. Um, this is uh, Alex Gray's painting for the cover of Rick Strassman's book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. Uh, here is a, an image of a UFO sighting in the 60s, and this is the 12th century Rupertsburg Codex. Uh, here in the sky, we see lots of eyes, which are a very common feature of, of the DMT experience, as a matter of fact. Um, and stars, and then we see a line coming down out of this object, and it's descending into the womb of a woman down here, we see a child in the womb, and then up here, what do we see? The little elf and a mushroom. What's going on here? And what on earth is going on here? 1710, baptism of Christ, What's that up there? <laughs> uh, is this the baptism of Christ or a shamanic initiation or, or what's, what's happening here? And then <sighs> mysterious books and a sense of mission and healing powers, they're common to these two domains as well. Maria Sabina was given a book by a spirit. She said she learned many things from the book which helped her to do her work better. But the spirit wouldn't allow her to keep the book and to bring it back with her, and it remains in the sky. Betty Hill had the same experience. She was given a large book by the individual she identified as the leader of the aliens, but he took it back from her before she left the ship. Betty Andreasen was given a small blue book with 40 luminous pages, but soon afterwards it disappeared. And like shamans who encountered spirits, many UFO abductees returned with a sense of mission and responsibility for the deep knowledge and, and healing powers that they believed they'd received. <coughs> what about fairies and elves? What are they? Uh, and uh, why have they got so much in common with aliens and spirits? The great work on this was published in 1969 by Jacques Vallée, <coughs> Passport to Magonia. Uh, in my book, Supernatural, I then took the dossier that he brought up to 1969 on the phenomenology of his experiences and brought it fully up to date. Uh, and what, what the point here is that let's look at these fairies, you know, from the Middle Ages until the 20th century, fairies, just like spirits and aliens, were renowned and feared for abducting people. You did not want to get too close to those fairies dancing in a ring. Were you to touch that dancing circle, you would find yourself transported into another world in an instant, in a flash. You'd be in another place. And there you might be entertained or looked after, certain things might happen to you, you might think that three or four hours have passed, and eventually you'd be allowed to go back to your world. But then you'd discover that your world had changed. 500 years had passed in those three hours that you spent in Fairyland. It's a bit like the missing time phenomenon with UFO abductees, except it seems the UFO abductions have got kinder. Now people just lose five hours, not five centuries. I sometimes wonder that, about that spinning process, which the flying saucers also do. Are we actually looking at some kind of technology, some kind of interdimensional technology, which is evolving? Um, fairies were sometimes cruel, tortured and hurt human beings, but they could also be kind and give gifts. 
Aliens do that as well. Fairies have the power of flight. They make use of aerial vehicles, flying boats, flying castles, flying carriages, etc. Uh, fairies would often abduct people underground into the hollow hills. Uh, we can see the little doorway in the hills there. Here, this young man is being seduced <coughs> by some fairy maids to enter fairyland. Interestingly, Amanita muscaria mushroom in the foreground there, a little clump of mushrooms here. I wonder if they're psilocybes. And uh, of course, like aliens, spirits, uh, fairies and elves often appear in the form of animals or orthereanthropes. There's Melusine, a very feared medieval fairy who was part serpent, part woman, and who abducted human children. Uh, here from a woodcut from Holland, 15th century, uh, a group of fairies <coughs> dancing in a ring. Uh, they are classic therianthropes, part human, part animal in form, classic creatures of vision, uh, really no different from the creatures of vision that we see on the, on the painted caves. And uh, here's an image from Angoulême in France. It's a human face, 27,000 years old. Just a hint of a dark eye, nose, a bit of a mouth, a high domed forehead. Uh, and then Pesh Merle Cave. I was privileged to sit in front of this image for, for several hours in Pesh Merle Cave. It's really extraordinary. What is this up here above it? And then look at the strange head of the creature. It's humanoid in form. Let's expand that head a little bit. Let's redraw it. And essentially it's that. And how different is that from the classic modern image of the alien grey? And then when you go to the painted caves as well, you find objects that archaeologists can't identify, like this one from Altamira or this one from Bernifal, but they look awfully like the flying saucers that Pablo Amarigo painted and described to me as vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. Three of these, there's three drawings here. Uh, one of them uh, was drawn in 1990 by one of John Mack's volunteers. The others are about uh, 20,000 years old, 15,000 years ago. Um, well, this is the modern image, and these are the ancient images. Uh, but I would suggest they're all inspired by the same experiences. Now we come to Rick Strassman, a really remarkable man. Did the, um, I know you're all very familiar with his work. He did the first work with human volunteers and DMT in the 1990s at the University of New Mexico. And it's really fascinating uh, how many of the accounts of Rick's volunteers overlap into the realm of UFO abductions. So here's Jim, and he's saying, there were clinical researchers probing into my mind. There were sort of long fiber optic things they were putting into my pupils. Carl saw a lot of elves, prankish and ornery elves. Uh, ben felt that something was inserted into his left forearm. Uh, Lucas uh, found himself a, above a space station, um, and, and, and then he found entities inside the space station that were doing some kind of routine technological work and paid no attention to him. In a state of overwhelmed confusion, I opened my eyes. The terrible drawing at the bottom right here was done by me uh, during an ayahuasca session in Brazil. It was the only time that I'd ever seen something that really looked like an alien. And there were flying saucers as well. And uh, it was kind of up there above me, and I'm sitting on this bench in the jungle, and I just know that they're going to take me. I'm going to be abducted, and I'm terrified. And I open my eyes and I shout, no! <laughs> and the vision vanishes. Of course, I should have kept my eyes closed and said, yes! <laughs> I should have girded up my courage and accepted that experience. But I didn't, and the alien-looking guys, they never come back. But uh, they're all over ancient art, these insect-like aliens. We find them in Tanzania, uh, and, and more of the accounts of Rick's volunteers here. So, something very interesting. A number of the volunteers who were spoken to in the DMT state by what they construed to be intelligent entities 
the intelligent entity said to them basically this, we're so glad you discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you more easily. DMT is an entirely natural product of the human body. But it's something quite unique. It's an endogenous human psychedelic. It's found in blood, plasma, urine, and cerebrospinal fluid. But we don't know its function, and that's largely because of lack of research. It's a, a Schedule One substance. But there is a definite association with the pineal gland. And Rick Strassman's uh, recent work at the Cottonwood Foundation have, have firmed that association up. Uh, quite a lot. Um, it may be not that it's produced in the pineal gland, but the pineal gland becomes a focus for the DMT. In evolutionary older animals such as lizards and amphibians, the pineal is called the third eye, and it actually possesses a lens, a cornea, and a retina. Um, with the bird, it no longer sits on top of the skull, but it's still light sensitive. In humans, it's moved deeper into the brain. It's not directly sensitive to light uh, anymore. My thought, maybe DMT is the lens on the pineal gland, which allows us a sixth sense, which allows us to transcend the physical senses and see beyond into other realities normally closed off to us. At any rate, Strassman recognized the remarkable similarities between the UFO abductees reports and the reports of his own volunteers, who we know weren't physically abducted because they remained on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico throughout the experience. And so what Strassman proposed is that UFO abductees might be spontaneous overproducers of endogenous DMT. But in saying that, I would not be doing justice to my friend Rick if I didn't also point out that he's at pains to emphasize that this did not imply that such experiences mediated by DMT were in any way unreal, simply that we need to expand our definition of reality. Uh, and this brings us back to the issue of the retuning of the receiver wavelength of the brain. By conceiving of the brain as a receiver of information, one can accommodate the biological model of changing brain function with a chemical. At the same time, it allows for the possibility that what is being received, while not usually perceptible, is consistently and verifiably existent for a large number of individuals. It may indeed reflect stable, freestanding, and parallel planes of reality. So for human beings, we cannot see something without interpreting it. Interpretation is built into perception from the get-go. I would say with spirits, aliens, and fairies, with the reports of modern lab volunteers, what the evidence suggests is that we are looking at the same very ancient and long-lived phenomenon of human visionary experience witnessed through different cultural spectacles by different peoples. So the visions are closed in the, clothed in the cultural spectacles of the time, but there's something universal and, and eternal about them. And from time to time, down the millennia, this has brought us the forbidden fruit of Gnosis and reawakened us to the true nature of things. And so what this says to me is that whatever psychedelics are, they are certainly not brain candy. Used responsibility, responsibly with the right intention, they can be utterly transformatory. And it's pleasing now to see that medical science slowly is catching up with the incredible potential of these medicines. Uh, for, for all aspects of the human experience. Um, the, the, the mystical properties of psilocybin are absolutely uh, confirmed. Uh, psilocybin research moving into the mainstream in, in many, many areas. And I hope that this will be the first step in a gradual process of rehabilitating these sacred medicines and bringing them back to their place and bringing our culture back to balance because our culture is a desperately unbalanced culture. And let's not forget uh, that this Apple computer that I'm projecting this show on, um, we owe it to LSD, basically. Um, Steve Jobs spoke about how taking LSD was one of the two or three most important things he'd ever done in his life. Uh, he hired programmers preferentially if they had had LSD experiences. He knew they'd do a better job. Um, and, and um, you know, in, in California, the connection between the psychedelic world and Developing computer science was very obvious during the 70s. Steve Wozniak later described in Time magazine how he got the concept of Apple, the first microcomputer, during an LSD trip. This is now being 
denied by uh, materialist productionist scientists, but uh, there's a lot to suggest that the discoverer of the double helix uh, made the breakthrough under the influence of LSD. <coughs> Francis Crick um, told a friend that he had first perceived the double helix shape while he was on LSD. LSD was, of course, totally legal during the late 40s and the 50s when Crick was taking it. Um, and uh, it's really fascinating to consider this. Of course, there were many aspects to the discovery of the double helix, but what Crick is saying is that the moment that he really got it was when he was under the influence of LSD. So if this is true, then one of the great scientific discoveries of the 20th century is not down to the alleged problem-solving state of consciousness so much as it's down to the visionary state of consciousness. Back to the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden and the knowledge, gnosis of good and evil being essential for the progress of the soul. And let's consider, again, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, who is a classic creature of vision. In almost every case, the serpent is depicted with a human head. A classic therian probe, kind of entity that you only see in visionary states. And that entity is bringing the message that we are here on Earth to learn and to grow and to develop. And in the process of learning and growing and develop, developing, it's important that we take responsibility for ourselves and that we do have knowledge of good and evil. And for seeking that knowledge of good and evil, we are told in the Bible that Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden and angels were posted at the entrances to the garden to prevent humanity from ever returning. And there's a really intriguing passage there. So he drove out the man he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the tree of life because there's an eerie passage in Genesis where where the entity that we are persuaded to believe is God speaks, we don't know who, uh, and, and, and says why he's going to do this, why Adam and Eve are to be kept out of the garden. They've discovered the tree of knowledge of good and evil already, but that entity does not want them to discover the tree of life. And the statement is made, lest they become gods like us. Who are those us? What actually are we dealing with here? In all of this, somewhere hidden away, the mystery of the knowledge of good and evil and the mystery of immortal life, I would suggest, lie hidden. Thank you. I wanted to make. And I'm going to make them. <laughs> because what's at stake is not a small thing. That a struggle is underway for the future direction of human consciousness. And uh, we live in a society that will send us to prison if we make use of time honored sacred plants to explore our own consciousness. <coughs> Yet surely the exploration and expansion of the miracle of our consciousness is the essence of what it is to be human. I've made this point many times, and I'll make it again now. If we live in a society that does not allow us as adults to make decisions about our own bodies and our own consciousness while doing no harm to others, if we live in such a society, then we cannot be said to be free in any meaningful sense. If we have no sovereignty over our own consciousness, then every other form of sovereignty that we believe we have is an illusion. And this is why I think the issue of psychedelics and the legal status of psychedelics is so important in our society. Because we already have all the laws we need to deal with people who get out of control and get in the face of other people. And I support those laws because we should not be getting in the faces of other people. But so long as we are working with psychedelics <coughs> privately in our own way, doing no harm to others with respect and with love, 
then it is a grotesque abuse of our fundamental human right to cognitive liberty as adults to impose prison sentences upon us for exploring our own consciousness. You know, if we're to heal the planet, then we're going to have to re-establish contact with spirit. And we're only going to do that if we first regain some of our consciousness. Otherwise, you know, who knows? Are we going to become the next lost civilization? I would say the choice is up to us. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going, to, we're going to do some Q&A, um, and then afterwards, if anybody wants a quick word with me, I'll be sitting there. If anybody wants a book signed, I'm happy to sign it. If anybody wants anything signed apart from a check, I'm happy to sign that. Um, anybody wants any pictures, happy to do those as well. This is the age of social media, don't be shy. Uh, okay, Q&A. Okay, so I wanted to ask you one of the things, but I just Oh. And uh, is what do you think is the connection between the ancient civilizations and opium, and the connection between opium and consciousness? Uh, okay, the, it's clear that opium was extensively used in the, in the ancient world, um, and and it's another one of those, in my view, another one of those allied plants. And and what what it seems to me that the the help that opium offers us is with the management of pain. It's extremely good for that, and, and uh, you know, if I were if I were to find myself in a terminal cancer situation, I would definitely go for for opium or heroin or whatever was uh, was available to 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 reduce the pain. I'd much rather do that than go through the hospital hospital route. Um, it's clear that, that there are visionary uh, aspects to to opium as as well. Um, I personally have no experience of opium or heroin, so I can't speak from. From experience in that in that way, um, but uh, I think that nature has provided us with a whole range of allied plants which have different functions. And it seems to me that the function of the opium poppy, the most useful function for humanity, is primarily to do with the management of pain. And used for that purpose, it's an extremely constructive and positive substance. In my view. But, uh, as I say, no personal experience on it. <laughs> yeah? If you were wanting to try ayahuasca, yeah. well, uh, you could have to... <laughs> Let's get your microphone. Let's get your microphone. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I shouldn't be choosing the questions. You should. All right, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll vary. From, but here, we'll, we'll, give the, we'll, we'll give you the microphone. There you are. Yes. Hi. Right. Um, hand, hands up. If I wanted to use ayahuasca, yeah. is it possible to get it in this country, or would I have to travel to Brazil or Peru? And do you know a good shaman that you would recommend? <laughs> um, the answer to both questions is yes. Um, however, uh, I would, I do not, I don't rush to encourage people to do ceremony in the British Isles. Um, I have had a number of extremely negative experiences during ceremony in the UK. And those negative experiences have been because the person facilitating the experience was primarily about making money. It was primarily about that. And they're packing in a lot of people. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think an ayahuasca session with 50 people is manageable. I think, that, I think it's good to keep ayahuasca sessions to a dozen or less. Uh, and preferably, because you know, all your barriers come down with ayahuasca. All the shields go down. That's how, how ayahuasca works. So you really want to be drinking with people you know, or who know people you know, people you can trust and feel at ease and comfortable with. There's a new phenomena in ayahuasca circles that, that I have now come across more than once, which I call psychic vampires. It's, it's people who are actually using the vulnerability of ayahuasca sessions to psychically dominate and control others. Um, this is a very, very bad problem, and it's a problem that should be managed by the shaman or facilitator, but often is not managed by that person. So there are a lot of, all is not sweetness and light in the ayahuasca garden. 
there, there are a lot of people offering ceremony who really haven't got a clue what they're doing. Uh, and, and I would never encourage somebody to buy the ingredients on the internet and, and make it at home. There's a deep cultural background to this. We should, we should learn from that. So I do think that you know, South America is the place to go, if possible. But that being said, there are some ceremonies being offered in the United Kingdom that are great. There are some people who are offering good ceremonies. I'm not going to recommend those. I'm not going to speak to that. I do have a fact sheet uh, concerning retreats in Peru, Brazil, and Costa Rica that um, I, I, can't, I can't give an unconditional guarantee, but the word I get on them, and some of them I participated in, is good. And I'm happy to share that fact sheet. Um, and, uh, oh well, I'll just send off, if anybody wants it, okay, here's my email address, gbhancock at gmail.com. <laughs> Title, I don't know, fact sheet. I, I won't be able to get into detailed correspondence. I already, I'm just overwhelmed these days. But I will send you the fact sheet if anybody wants it. And um, you can take it from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, if someone was to go on the own ayahuasca experience, what uh, age do you recommend they should be before they decide? Well, I said at the beginning, I, I think, where are you, by the way? There you are. What age are you? Uh, 15. 15? Um, I, I would say wait a few years. Uh, the ayahuasca will still be there. And you'll, have, you'll have grown into it in a way that you might not be. I, it's one of those things that's really worth waiting for. It's worth, it's worth getting yourself, you know, set a little bit on your path. A little bit. Because ayahuasca tends to cause you to question everything. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush. To, uh, certainly when I was a teenager, I'm really glad I didn't have ayahuasca. Um, but as an as an ad, I think it, I think it's right and proper for adults. Where exactly the line of adulthood comes, whether it's 18, whether it's 21, I don't know exactly. I, I don't I don't know. But I def I think I think 15 is a little bit too young. I would say definitely be over 18. Uh, I'm leave, letting these guys choose the question. Okay. Uh, hello, Graham. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm very interested. I heard on a podcast that you were talking to a couple of lively foreign people and you were talking about ayahuasca mother gave you a great kick in yeah. about your um, abuse cannabis with cannabis yes. and you said that it displayed itself as an entity. Can you describe this more? Because I've had spooky experiences uh -huh. and I watched Hammer House Horror when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the entity, the entity that communicated with me is the entity that I call Mother Ayahuasca. Uh, and and I, I see her in a number of different forms, sometimes as a human woman, sometimes as a jaguar, not the car, but the big cat, and sometimes uh, as a serpent. And she was in serpent form uh, at, that, at that point. Uh, it was a, a, very, a series of very powerful visions that caused me in October 2011 uh, to quit a 24-year cannabis habit. Um, and I went then three years without smoking any cannabis at all, until I found myself back on the Joe Rogan show <laughs> in September 2014. <laughs> And Joe and I, we were talking about cannabis, and Joe said, so you're still not smoking the, the cannabis? And I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not, actually. And, but I said, you know, after three years, I'm wondering if I, it's time to dip my toes back in the water. And, and Joe says, well, how about now? I pulls out a joint. You know, so I smoked it with him on air. And uh, it's amazing how one's tolerance level drops when you <laughs> Uh, I somehow managed to hold it together, and uh, at the uh, at, at the end of it, I I, I don't um, I don't any longer I don't any longer feel the way that I felt about 
cannabis. Uh, I feel it's possible to have a relationship with cannabis that is not abusive, where I don't use it 24 hours a day, or anyway, 16 hours a day, where it plays a small but useful part in my life rather than an overwhelming part in my life. And that's where I am with, with cannabis now. But on the entity issue, a big serpent with really lovely eyes. <laughs> okay, next. Who's next? Yes? Hello. Um, Hi. Uh, uh, all right. Where are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, earlier on, you had said that you didn't think the shaman shamans had discovered DMT through trial and error. No. So, how did they discover it? Well, they say the spirits taught their ancestors how to do it. Um, and perhaps the mechanism for that was an, an, an anadonatra snuff or uh, the yopo, you know. Perhaps that's where that encounter came, where the spirit said, by the way, there's a way you can extend this experience for five or six hours, you know, and uh, gave them ayahuasca. Uh, that's what they say, and that's all I know. But as a feat of, if it's were done by trial and error, it's an extraordinary achievement. Yeah, sorry, 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 I was thinking, so um, what process other than um, them being told indiscriminately that that was the thing to do, do you believe, or is you just think it happened? I think they were told by the spirits what to do. I think, I think we are surrounded by other dimensions. I think those other dimensions are very real and they interact with us whether we like it or not. Shamans get proactive about that and, and enter into those other dimensions and they sometimes come back with news. They come back with information, with, with evidence, and not only shamans. So, Scientists who drink ayahuasca often get insights into their field as well. Sorry, but what I was trying to get at is, is that not like the infinite turtle thing whereby you just say, um, well, the thing before said that that was how it was and, and therefore you go. Well, no, not really. I think, I think, that, I think what, they're, what they're saying is that a, a visionary encounter taught them this information. And that doesn't seem strange to me because I wasn't a novelist until I drank ayahuasca. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly I became somebody who could write novels. This was totally new to me. So I received new information in that realm, which I was then able to deploy in my realm. Yeah, okay, sorry, I, I don't take any more of your time to In order to consume the thing, you have to have the information on how to consume it. Yes, but the snuffs are very easy. You just okay. snuff on one substance. You don't have to put together two different complete things. Okay, that was the answer, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, next. Uh, yes. In terms of legal psychedelic use, how do you see it being integrated in our society in the future? Like, personally, I see it more as like a bar mitzvah, a rite of passage, learning the ways of the world kind of ceremony happening, well, maybe I, coming I, of AJT. I actually don't think that we should we should prescribe the way that it will be used in the future. I agree. I think we should simply remove the barriers. I think we should, I think we should legalize psychedelics and accompany that legalization with wise advice that people will believe. The problem at the moment is that the state agencies issuing their comments on drugs are disbelieved by everybody with good reason because they lie all the time. You know, once, once these substances are legalized, then we can have resources of really good, reliable information that people can go to, as adults do, to find out whether they want to do something on that. And that's how, so I would say that what we need to do is to get rid of these very bad laws that have caused such a lot of harm, and then trust in humanity to put together the right solutions to, to deal with this in the future. Great. Yeah. Oh. I'm here. Oh, you don't really need to look at me. I don't know what you are. <laughs> Stand up, that'll make my life easier. Okay, you have uh, a hat. Just a comment we made about the Gnostic belief in the church. Yes. Uh, do you, is that a belief that you hold? That there is a sort of archonic energy, demonic, powerful being? I just say it because yeah. I was brought up by a Jehovah's Witness. Uh -huh. and, uh, Jehovah and uh, the Demorge. Yeah. <laughs> I was brought up that way. And, I've had a very big experience of it and being shunned from that and mm -hmm. coming. When I read, it was, an, it was the back of your book about the, uh, I don't know the name, sorry, and you'd mentioned the Gnostic belief. Yeah. And it was like a revelation to me and it just sort of pulled me out of my guilt. Good. I'm glad, I'm glad, thought, I'm glad that it did. I think, know, I think all, more people need to know about Gnosticism. Yeah, definitely. It is, it is, a, it is, um, 
you know, actually profoundly subversive material. It undercuts everything that we've been taught is the case. So do you? Do I subscribe to that view? That we no. live yeah. in a university of duality? <coughs> yes, I do. Yeah. I don't think duality is all that there is. Definitely. But I think it's a teaching system that we have here in this incarnation of this material plane. That's what this life has to offer. It has offered us teachings where, where we define ourselves and grow by the very choices we make between those poles. And perhaps beyond that, there is a unity that we can come to. Yeah, thanks very much for starting this whole journey off. And thank, you. thank you. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm what you might call an armchair activist. Mm -hmm. I'm quite vocal on social media, but I was wondering if you can give me advice of what I can physically do to bring about the change in laws and stop this war on drugs. I think that more, more and more our members of parliament need to know that we don't want to vote for them unless they're going to take a serious look at the drug laws. This is, this is, this is not to be relegated as a, as a trivial issue. This is a very important issue. People, people think there's all sorts of media reactions that it's just about getting high, it's just trivial, it's not important. It's deeply, fundamentally important because it concerns adult sovereignty. And, and our sovereignty as adults is just being steamrolled by the state right now in this area. So we need to make it clear to our elected representatives that we will not vote for them unless they address this problem and do something about it. That's the way things work politically in our society. And we should use the system. It's beginning to work in America. You know, It's amazing, really, what's happening in America through grassroots activism. Now we have completely legal cannabis in Colorado, for example. And it's great to travel in Colorado these days. And actually to be treated as an adult you know, by fellow adults. It's a, really, it's a really good thing. So I would say that politicians do respond to the will of the public. Uh, if it's expressed forcefully enough to them. Another thing that brings it across is petition, which can show that there is support behind the nation. You need to change these laws and then get behind people like the Beckham Foundation, who are really doing serious work at the legal level in solving these problems. Beckley Foundation, which is run by an amazing lady called Amanda Field. You'll find them on the internet. Cheers. Uh, okay, next. Um, Yes. Excuse me, have you experienced wrath at all? Stand up, stand up. Where are you? Who's speaking? You, there you are. Okay, have I experienced? Have you experienced wrath at all? Did you say wrath? I was going to say, wrath. Wrath. I, uh, I have a very broken relationship. I experience wrath every time I encounter bureaucracy. <laughs> I have a very broken relationship with DMT. Um, largely from overuse of a period of time. I, I did the classic do it in your kitchen tech and wanted to put more of it in an issue. Ah, really. Yes. Um, and I was wondering how you best go about repairing the relationship uh, with, with, as you said, Mother Ayahuasca. Or, uh, also, have you have you drunk ayahuasca, or have you simply smoked DMT? Uh, simply smoked rather a large array of Chang'e races. Chang'e, yeah. Which is which is not as strong as you could get with some DMT. I mean, it's uh, it, the Chang'e can be very strong, but it's, uh, it's not pure DMT. Um, well, interesting. I would I would say. I have seen people in DMT sessions um, roar and shout and scream it's as though they're wrestling with some inner demon. Um, I don't know, is that what happens to you? Do you get very vocal in that? Uh, it, took a, it took an array of forms uh, ranging from things like taking very small dosages to reach threshold and it lasting way longer than it should have. Sitting there on DMT for five hours for one tiny little dose and you're like, why is this happening to me? Had you taken any monoamine oxidase? Oh, no, 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 this was, this, was, this was just a small dose, but as I say, I've been doing small doses five to six times a day for four months. Yeah. Um, Thank you. <laughs> very, very dedicated. Very dedicated. Taking, and taking full advantage of DMT's quality, which is that no tolerance is ever built up. You can't build up tolerance. I really wanted to know. I asked a lot of questions and not a lot of answers, and so I, I pushed it further and further and further, and it provided more and more of these wonderful questions, you know, these, these insights into your universe and your life, and yeah. the way things go. Um, but 
they never provided any answers. <laughs> Things have gotten out of sequence, out of time, yeah. uh, or I've experienced minor changes in my dimension. Like, for example, you'd be sitting there wearing a red t-shirt, and you'd come back from the trip wearing a green t-shirt. <laughs> Nothing else had changed but that. Okay. You'd say to the guy in the room, I was wearing a red t-shirt, and he'd no, I'm not even wearing a red I think I think you ought to you ought to have to find some way to ask me the ayahuasca sessions and see what happens there. Ayahuasca, yeah, because because with ayahuasca you have time to you have time to really work through the experience. Uh, I've 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 heard DMT described as uh, drug rape in a way because DMT just utterly overwhelms you. There's no negotiation with it. I mean, it's like a, a rocket ship to the other side of reality uh, and. and um, I've told this story, this story before, but the, 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 the DMT trip I had in October 2011, just prior to my ayahuasca sessions that caused me to give up cannabis for three years, in that DMT session, which followed um, in the same location the previous year, a number of beautiful, healing, lovely DMT sessions, I went into that session. Actually, Mitch Schultz, who made the film DMT, the Spirit Molecule, held a pipe for me. Uh, I was encouraged to take huge draws on the pipe. I got up to number four, four huge inhales. I have no place for a wrath with DMT. I just collapse. I just went. I just went back on the bed. I can't. I can't even move. And then I. And then I found myself drawn into this really hellish realm. Um, and and a voice said to me. You're ours now. <laughs> and I said, fuck yes, but only for 12 minutes. <laughs> and, and that is pretty much all I remember, apart from a feeling of horror. Um, I find it helps to unpack experiences like that to work with ayahuasca, where, where there is more room for negotiation, where you can you can have time to integrate and learn from what you're doing. So I would say that would be the way to to get closure on this issue. Yeah. Um, hello. Hello. Where are you? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned time um, in, a in relation to abduction, and I was wondering what is the experience? How do you experience time when you take ayahuasca? Like, mm. if it is different, why do you think? Yes, uh, the experience of the flow of time is is different with with ayahuasca, and and you know, but it, but it can vary. You can have the sense that you've only been there for a few minutes, and actually it was a few hours, or it can be the other way around. Um, but this isn't surprising, really. I mean, our experience of time does vary according to the circumstances we're in. I mean, time can appear to pass very slowly, but if you stand under a nice cold. Shower. I mean, time can appear to pass very fast, but if you pass, stand under a nice cold shower, it'll pass very slowly. Um, and I, I think that uh, there, there is a there is a definite a definite sense of time as a dimension in, in in ayahuasca. It is an element of the of the process. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is about the pine cone staff. Yes. That was in one of your talks. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that's just a reference to the pineal gland, or might that be another form of symbolism about that particular genus of plants <coughs> in pine trees? Where the beneath which Amanita muscaria grow, as a matter of fact, very often. Is that what your thought is? I mean, why would why would they why would they want to specify that particular genus? What special about? If you get my email, I'll be able to I'll be able to tell you more about that. Okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to bore everyone. All right. It's very long. Tell me more, but I, I warn you that, that I get so many emails that I may not be able to no respond to them. But send it, I'll have a look, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to be here for a while longer. I will, I will sit there, anybody wants to come and say hello, come and say hello, whenever I'm there.